Well, it's a great pleasure to be with everybody today. Thank you, Dr. Love and, and the entire team for inviting me. My name is Seth Wander. I'm one of the breast medical oncologists at Massachusetts General Hospital here in Boston. And it's my pleasure to talk with you today uh, about overcoming endocrine resistance in ER-positive metastatic breast cancer. Here's an overview of some of the topics we'll discuss today. We'll spend a couple of minutes talking about mechanisms of resistance to antiestrogen therapy and hormone receptor positive metastatic disease. We'll talk about optimal approaches to biomarker assessment and genomic sequencing in these patients. We'll discuss updated phase three data from the Emerald study guiding elicestrant use. And we'll focus on a couple of exciting emerging oral selective estrogen receptor degraders, camisestrant and imlunestrant. We'll then switch gears a little bit and talk about phase three data from the Capitello 291 study, guiding the use of the first approved AKT inhibitor, Capivacertib, in this patient population. And then we'll end with a couple of additional promising antiestrogen agents, including Veptigestrant and Lazafoxifene, uh, with a summary and some future directions. So let's start with the exciting topic of resistance to antiestrogen therapy, and this has been a really rapidly evolving field over the last several years. And throughout uh, the talk today, we'll have a few representative cases. So here's the first case, a 55-year-old postmenopausal woman with a history of a left-sided T1N1 hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer. She's treated with excision and has an elevated oncotype score at 35 and receives postoperative chemotherapy and radiation treatment in 2018. She subsequently begins anastrozole and reports good adherence since 2019. She now presents with refractory back and hip pain. She had prior negative germline testing and has a PET CT now with diffuse osseous metastatic disease. We biopsy one of the bone sites and that reveals metastatic breast cancer, strongly positive for the estrogen receptor, negative for the progesterone receptor, and negative for HER2 with an IHC score of one plus. So some of the questions we'll return to in a couple of minutes. What are the potential resistance drivers in this scenario? What's the optimal approach to next generation sequencing in a patient like this with newly diagnosed metastatic disease? And what are some of the key actionable genomic alterations in this patient population with hormone receptor positive metastatic disease? So here's the road to personalized therapy. Dr. Love and I were just talking about the fact that really in the late 1970s, tamoxifen was the first targeted therapy probably in all of oncology. Subsequently, in the 1990s, we saw the development of the aromatase inhibitors, which are uh, still in widespread use, letrozole, anastrozole, and eczemestane. And in 2002, we saw the first selective estrogen receptor degrader, fulvestrant, which we know is an injectable uh, medication. Starting in 2015, we saw the approval of three CDK4-6 inhibitors, palbocyclib, ribocyclib, and abemocyclib. And now in the last couple of years, we have several really exciting new approvals, including the first PI3 kinase inhibitor, alpelisib, the first oral selective estrogen receptor degrader, elicestrant, and the first AKT inhibitor, capivacertib. I put uh, special stars on those three because they really are the first that require next generation sequencing and have speci specific molecular alterations that guide their deployment in this patient population. And we'll talk about these today. Here's a, a broad schematic overview of uh, estrogen metabolism. In premenopausal women, the vast majority of estrogen is produced by the ovaries, but still about 10 to 20% of estrogen in um, women and uh, some low levels of estrogen in men are generated from uh, peripheral conversion of adrenal steroid hormones in uh, adipose tissue by the enzyme aromatase. Those are the two main sources of estrogen. And so we see here that estrogen uh, can interact with its receptor. That that's blocked by the selective estrogen receptor modulators, including tamoxifen. We see that the aromatase inhibitors act at the level of the adipose tissue by blocking the aromatase enzyme. Those are the uh, letrozole and astrozole and eczemestane. And then we see that the SIRDs, the estrogen receptor degraders, actually break the receptor down. All of these are mechanisms to block the interaction of estrogen with its receptor, thereby reducing its effect on downstream transcriptional targets and proliferation. Now, we've learned a lot about mechanisms of resistance to antiestrogens based upon next-generation sequencing. 
Here's a nice review from a few years ago in uh, Nature Reviews Clinical Oncology, highlighting the fact that ESR1 mutations, which are mutations that arise in the gene that encodes the estrogen receptor, are relatively rare in de novo untreated primary breast cancers. So for example, if you look at TCGA analysis, it's only when you start to sequence patients after the development of resistant metastatic disease that you see significant enrichment in these alterations. They tend to occur in the ligand binding domain of the protein, and they result in constitutive activation of the receptor even in the absence of ligand. So that explains why under selective pressure with an aromatase inhibitor, you start to see uh, enrichment in these alterations because even if the ligand disappears based on downregulation in, the, um, in aromatase, the uh, uh, receptor can still constitutively activate and cause downstream signaling. And the moral of the story here is that you really have to think about sequencing these patients after the development of resistance. If you sequence them early in the course of their disease, either the primary tumor or at the outset of metastatic disease, it's likely that you may not be able to detect an ESR1 mutation. It isn't until later after they progress on AI therapy. And here's some of that data, uh, now a few years old, based on combined analysis of the SOFIA and the EFFECT studies. And you can see on the uh, top uh, left-hand side that for ESR1 mutant patients, uh, they fare worse on eczemestane when compared to fulvestrant. At the same time, if they're ESR1 wild type on the, on the right-hand side, they have fairly equivalent outcomes regardless of whether they use the um, uh, the uh, eczemestane or the uh, SERD fulvestrant. And on the bottom, you can see a combination analysis of these uh, uh, cohorts, where again, you see that the patients who are faring the worst are the patients who have ESR1 mutations and go on to receive the aromatase inhibitor eczemestane. Uh, so this data and other subsequent data clearly demonstrated that ESR1 mutations predict inferior response to aromatase inhibitors, but the impact on, I think, SIRDs and CDK4-6 inhibitor response is less clear. And this is a, a very active area of uh, research. Let me pause there and turn it over to Dr. Love. So yeah, <clears throat> before you go on, I just wanted to um, sort of clarify something. So first of all, the case that you present, is that an actual patient or more scenario? Uh, yes, no, that is an actual patient. So when the patient got an astral starting 2019, when did she develop metastatic disease? Uh, just within the last year or so. So she was so in 2023, for four so years. four years. Mm -hmm. Four years, okay, yeah. <clears throat> because um, it, it kind of made me bring up, uh, think about the issue that I know we'll talk about later and that you're going to talk about in terms of endocrine, endocrine sensitivity and resistance de novo. And mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, and, and you know, in terms of when they relapse as that as a factor. But the thing that I was just sort of thinking about was, is Oncotype in any way helpful in assessing endocrine sensitivity? Because I noticed that the Oncotype is high, which I guess would mean that the ER would be lower. Uh, and yet, on the actual IHC or whatever was 80%. So like what's more reliable from that point of view? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question uh, and, and really an important area of research, right? The oncotype reflects uh, expression of 21 different genes across the cancer, some of which have to do with estrogen receptor signaling, but we also have um, more general markers of proliferation, HER2 biology, et cetera. In, in her case, we saw that the ER was high and the PR was low, uh, which tends to correlate more with like a luminal B phenotype and often tends to correlate with a little bit of a higher oncotype score. And for those institutions, that use KI-67, perhaps a higher proliferative score. So I think um, maybe to some extent, it's a little bit of like chicken and egg, right? Like the tumor biology might start off with, you know, one of those luminal B, higher proliferative subtypes, maybe higher overall uh, recurrence rate. Of course, the patient appropriately got chemotherapy, radiation treatment, et cetera. Uh, but still, the recurrence risk isn't zero. And, you know, I think to your point, those type of patients, when they do recur, you know, it might predict kind of worse biology of disease for some of the reasons that you're alluding to. I was just sort of anticipating as we start getting into some, you know, clinical scenarios and sort of how you manage it. Again, this issue of trying to assess clinical endocrine resistance, so to speak. And again, I've heard about this issue of how long were they on, you know, adjuvant treatment as one. But what I'm asking here is, is can you look at the actual ER level in IHC or the oncotype to help or that really isn't that helpful? 
Yeah, I think we don't have great data looking backwards at oncotype and then behavior of the tumor at the time of metastatic disease, which I think is a really interesting question. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if we looked at that more systematically and saw that, for example, those patients with the very high proliferative index and, you know, the higher oncotype might predict, you know, perhaps um, more difficult disease at the outset of metastatic uh, outgrowth. Um, and I think there are lots of different roads that we'll start to talk about how to, you know, achieve um, estrogen independence. And one of the points that you're bringing up that I think really is becoming a very important dichotomy in the field is this idea of uh, once the tumor becomes sort of resistant to standard, you know, first-line anti-estrogen therapy, does it continue to be an estrogen-dependent tumor? Like, for example, ESR1 activated tumors that are still signaling through the ER dependent pathways, or does it become a completely estrogen independent tumor, which can happen through a lot of different mechanisms, including loss of ER expression entirely, or activation of RAS or uh, loss of RB and other, you know, type of um, genomic molecular factors. And I think those discussions that you're alluding to are 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 just starting to happen because we're really appreciating, you know, this idea of estrogen continued dependence versus estrogen independence, despite progression on those traditionally available oral medications. Yeah, I mean, actually, I've heard people say that ESR1 mutations are actually a, you know, a sign of estrogen dependence compared to exactly. ESR1 you know, wild type. So I guess that, exactly. to some extent, is predictive also. It's almost the, the traditional notion of kind of oncogene addiction, right? Like in HER2 mm -hmm. positive, that, that you can continue right. to kind of hit that same pathway with better drugs versus in right. other instances, it probably will not be fruitful, you know, to continue down the kind of ER dependent pathway. So I think that's a really important point. And we will touch on some of those mechanisms over the next few minutes. So here's the data suggesting, again, um, ESR1 mutations predict inferior outcome on aromatase inhibitor therapy. But I think the impact on SIRDs uh, is less clear, and this is something that people kind of take for granted. But here's data from the Plasma Match study published a few years ago uh, by Dr. Turner uh, in Lancet Oncology and his team. Here's over 70 patients, ESR1 mutant. They received high-dose fulvestrin, so even a higher dose than we typically give in clinic. Uh, here, the median progression-free survival was only 2.2 months. Now, this is a little bit of apples and oranges. This is a more heavily pretreated population. They'd had multiple lines of endocrine therapy. Most of them had had prior chemotherapy. But I think this notion uh, you know, that... E ESR1 mutation is definitely sensitive to fulvestrin is likely overly simplistic. And in both the laboratory and in some of these clinical uh, cohorts, we're seeing clear uh, signs that there may be at least partial or complete resistance in some cases. So to bring us all back to uh, some of our college biochemistry, uh, I just want to highlight some of the cell cycle biology that's relevant to our discussion here. So we know that the most tightly regulated uh, transition point in the cell cycle is the G1 to S transition. And here we have uh, extracellular mitogens, including estrogen, that cause upregulation of D-type cyclins, those complex with the cyclin-dependent kinase 4 and 6 uh, uh, agents, those active cyclin CDK complexes then phosphorylate the retinoblastoma tumor suppressor. And as RB becomes hyperphosphorylated, it becomes inactive and it releases E2F, which is a key transcription factor that drives upregulation of multiple genes, which regulate that transition through the G1 to S checkpoint and allow cells to progress with DNA synthesis and subsequently division. And so when we're using CDK inhibitors, we are uh, impacting those active cyclin uh, CDK complexes. And, and when we combine those with antiestrogens upstream, we see a synergistic effect, which has been demonstrated in multiple preclinical uh, models, early phase, and then late phase clinical trials. Now, there have been lots of efforts over recent years by our group and many others to define uh, resistance mechanisms, both to CDK inhibitors and to antiestrogens. Because these drugs are given in combination, typically in the first-line metastatic setting, you really have to think about resistance in a combinatorial way. It's not enough simply to model resistance to the CDK inhibitor. And this uh, paper and, and uh, schema uh, summarizes lots of work uh, over the last five to 10 years. Broadly speaking, many of the resistance drivers to CDK inhibitors and antiestrogens can be divided into cell cycle regulators on the left and oncogenic signal transduction mediators on the right. So on the left, you see things like uh, cyclin E amplification, CDK2 activation, uh, CDK6 upregulation, 
RB loss, aurora kinase upregulation. All of these things are different mechanisms to help drive cell cycle progression, even in the setting of CDK4-6 blockade. On the right, you see some of these canonical oncogenic pathways that are upregulated to provoke resistance to both the antiestrogen and the CDK inhibitor, including the RASMAP kinase pathway, the PI3 kinase AKT pathway. And you know, to the point we were just discussing, again, here, this is one way to think about it at the level of molecular function. The other way to think about it clinically is continued ER dependence versus ER independence. And you can start to bucket some of these alterations into that dichotomy as well. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we move on here. And what you can see here also in yellow are some of the potential therapeutic interventions that might be used in the setting of some of these resistance mediators. And um, after thinking about all of this, you know, we need to come back and decide, well, how do we determine what the resistance mechanism is? How should we sequence? When should we sequence? And then how do we use that information to move forward to make good clinical decisions? So here's an example of uh, circulating tumor DNA sequencing. This is from a garden assay. There are a number of different companies that have developed both uh, CLIA-approved solid tumor assays and liquid assays. And you know, circulating tumor DNA is really an exciting technology that was really just coming into fruition as I was finishing my training, uh, you know, five to ten years ago. And here, what you can do is detect two really important pieces of information in the blood. The first thing you can detect is the overall level of circulating tumor DNA meaning more disease burden, more circulating tumor DNA being shed into the periphery. The second thing you can look at are specific genetic changes that, are, that rise and fall over time under pressure on specific therapy. And here you can see a patient that at the time of diagnosis had a P10 and a BRCA2 frame shift mutation. And then two years later, after she developed resistance to antiestrogen therapy, she developed several mutations, including the ESR1 mutation you see there in light green that was not not present at the time of the initial diagnosis. This is important because we now have several new drugs that we just alluded to that are based upon the presence of specific targetable genomic changes, and it also helps us to decide what clinical trial opportunities might be beneficial for these patients based on specific um, targetable changes. Now, when we published this paper a few years ago, we were describing the landscape of resistance to CDK4-6 inhibitors uh, based on exome sequencing of tumor biopsies and based on preclinical validation in the laboratory. And we came up with a model that looks something like this. The moral of the story was that there was no single dominant resistance driver to CDK4-6 inhibitors, and a single kind of uh, one-size-fits-all approach was unlikely to work. But we did identify loss of RB, activation of aurora kinase, activation of HER2 and FGFR, activation of RAS and AKT, and upregulation of cyclin E as key mechanisms. And all of these things had potential interventions, either currently available in the clinic or in active clinical development. So we developed a model that looks something like this, saying if you sequence a patient at the time of progression on antiestrogen and CDK therapy, you can then identify potential resistance mechanisms and then make smart decisions about clinical trial opportunities or hopefully available drugs as they continue to come into clinical practice. And since this work was done, we've actually seen approval, right, uh, of AKT inhibitors in this setting. We also have PI3K uh, inhibitors and now next generation SIRDs for ESR1. So let's come back to our case that we were just talking about. Locally advanced breast cancer. Uh, she uh, has uh, an astrazole for uh, three to four years with good adherence, she progresses. So what are the potential resistance drivers? So we might expect in this situation, you can see upwards of 20 to 40 percent uh, alteration of ESR1 after progression on an aromatase inhibitor. You could see complete loss of ER expression to come to your point about total ER independence. We might see oncogenic pathway activation, AKT, RAS, et cetera. And then when should we biopsy? How should we biopsy? How should we sequence? I think uh, this is debatable. Uh, you could do a solid tumor biopsy at the time of metastatic diagnosis, which is typically done to confirm disease, and you can sequence that biopsy via targeted assay. You could also do blood, and you could potentially do both. In my own clinical practice, I tend to biopsy the initial metastatic uh, uh, site that we biopsy, we do that for sequencing. I'll also get a concurrent, concurrent blood biopsy. You see about 80% 
uh, correlation between those two, but there may be some things that are detected on the blood, not detected on the solid tumor and, and vice versa. And then I tend to repeat blood-based biopsy at the time of progression in the future, again, looking for acquisition of resistance drivers. So if they're ESR1 wild type at baseline, we can see acquisition of a mutation later on. And then what are some of the key genomic alterations here? Well, we've already talked about some of them, and we'll see data for some of them soon. Uh, pic 3 ca alterations for alpelacib, elicestrin for ESR1, uh, Capivacertib was recently approved for pic 3 ca uh, AKT, and P10. And then there are a couple of tissue agnostic biomarkers, for example, uh, MSI status, high TMB, NTREC fusions, all of these things have kind of um, blanket solid tumor approvals based on uh, next generation sequencing. And I think they should be considered here uh, if they were to be detected. So with that in mind, let's start to look at some of the exciting new data for some of these agents. We'll start with elicestrant uh, based on the phase three Emerald trial. And uh, we'll kick this off with a second case. Uh, a 63-year-old woman, this patient has de novo hormone receptor positive HER2 negative metastatic disease. She previously received first-line metastatic therapy with letrozole and ribocyclib and had a great response uh, more than three years on treatment. She now has evidence of progression in multiple osseous sites and in the liver, though her liver function tests remain within normal limits. She also had prior negative germline testing. She had a PET CT with diffuse osseous metastatic disease, uh, progression, as we mentioned, in the bone and in the liver. She had baseline CT DNA at the time of metastatic diagnosis that was negative for any actionable alterations. We just did an updated CT DNA that now has an ESR1 D538G and a cyclin E1 amplification. She is negative for PIK3CA, P10, and AKT. So in this scenario, what are the potential resistance drivers? What is the role for elicestrant? What are the predictors of good response or resistance to this strategy? And are we seeing efficacy differences uh, or toxicity differences among some of the novel oral SIRDs? And we'll touch on all of these points in the next few minutes. Let's start with the Emerald study. So this was a randomized open label phase three study that accrued postmenopausal women and men with hormone receptor positive advanced or metastatic breast cancer. They could have had up to one prior line of chemotherapy. They were allowed to have had one to two prior lines of endocrine therapy, and they had to have prior treatment with a CDK4-6 inhibitor. I harp on that because we'll compare and contrast some of these trials. As we try to interpret some of the efficacy data for these drugs, it's important to understand subtle but important differences in the inclusion criteria for the studies. Some of the studies allowed prior fulvestrin, some didn't. Some of the studies mandated prior CDK inhibitor, some permitted it. Some of them required ESR1 mutation, some of them did not. So here, ESR1 was not required, but it was a stratification factor, as was prior fulvestrin or visceral disease. Over 460 patients participated in the study. They were randomized to elicestrant monotherapy or endocrine therapy of physician's choice, uh, either one of the various aromatase inhibitors or fulvestrant. Primary endpoint was progression-free survival. Uh, typical secondary endpoints included overall survival, stratification by ESR1, uh, response rates, safety, uh, pharmacokinetics, et cetera. Here's the data that was published in 2022 uh, in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. Uh, what you see here is a median progression-free survival improvement on the left in the intention to treat population from approximately 1.9 months to 2.8 months. This corresponded with a hazard ratio of 0.68 and a significant p-value. The theme here is that for the ESR1 mutant subpopulation, we saw a little bit of a better shift in the curves from uh, a median PFS of about 1.9 months to almost 3.8 months with a slightly better hazard ratio of 0.5 and again, a highly significant p-value. Now, when this data first came out, it was really important uh, proof of concept that there was some activity, and this was the first oral SIRD uh, to have prospective phase three data uh, that was uh, positive. Although I think there's been some debate about the clinical significance of the shifts in these curves and you know, ongoing discussions to try to determine which patients might be uh, most able to benefit from this strategy and moving forward, what are some of the key combinatorial uh, strategies that we might be able to develop to augment the degree of uh, fairly limited clinical benefit we're seeing here with monotherapy in this pretreated population. To that end, uh, at the San Antonio conference in 2022, the team presented some interesting updates. Here you see the same data from Emerald 
stratified by the prior duration of CDK4-6 inhibitor. So on the left, we see patients that had at least six months. On the right, far right side, we see patients who'd had at least a year and a half. And if you look at the trend in median progression-free survival, you see that the space between the curves uh, is shifting and that there seems to be more clinical benefit for patients that had longer prior duration of CDK4-6 inhibitor. In the patients with only six months or at least six months, it was uh, 1.9 months up to 2.8 months, similar to the intention to treat population. In the patients that had at least a year and a half, we saw improvement from about 3.3 months up to five and a half months. The other thing I'll point out that may come up during the discussion is you see a really steep drop-off in both curves right off the jump, right? As soon as the trial starts in both groups, the uh, standard antiestrogen and the N uh, elicestrin, you see a steep drop, then the curves begin to separate. And I think this discussion, Neil, that we're starting to have about estrogen dependent versus independent is really manifested in that curve. The estrogen independent folks are the quick drop right off the jump. It doesn't matter whether you use fulvestrant, elicestrin, AI, these patients, you know, really are not responding to any antiestrogen. Whereas once you take those patients out of the study, you start to see separation of the curves and some benefit for the elicestrin strategy. Now, if we take this data and we actually layer the ESR1 on top of it, you see even more impressive shift in the curves. So now we're looking at the same um, breakdown, 6, 12, 18 months of CDK, now only in the ESR1 mutant population. And if you draw your attention to the 18 month, you can see now what starts to look like really clinic, clinically meaningful benefit uh, for those of us who see a lot of patients in, in clinical practice. Now you're seeing a, an improvement from about two months median progression-free survival to over eight months. And so the take-home message here is that for ESR1 mutant patients who have a long prior duration of treatment on CDK4-6 inhibitor, they may be the best candidates to think about the currently available kind of elicestrin monotherapy option. And again, we may be enriching here at the genomic level for patients that have continued kind of ER dependence, even in the setting of, of resistance to first-line therapy. So, uh, I, you know, I know that it's one issue about sort of what the curves look like, but if you actually look at the hazard ratio, to me, it doesn't look that different. You know, less than six months, 0.51 more than 18.46. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. that doesn't seem that much different. Right. The hazard ratio is, as you mentioned, you know, they're a little bit better if you look at the um, ESR1 mutant versus the intention to treat. But here, we're not seeing a huge shift in the hazard ratio, despite seeing some of the shift in the curves. And I think that's a great point. And as we look at interpreting these studies, we have to sort of look at it from all angles, right? We're looking at the statistical power of the hazard ratio, the confidence interval, the p-value, but then we also have to look at the, the uh, magnitude of clinical benefit. And, you know, I was having this debate recently, kind of comparing some of this data to, for example, Monarch 3, where you have, you know, a really big shift in the curves in the survival data, right? But the hazard ratio and the p-value didn't meet, you know, the pre-specified endpoint. So a lot of this has to do, as, as of course we know, with sample size, uh, with uh, duration of follow-up, right, with um, patient population. But I think your point is, you know, very well taken here, that we're not seeing, you know, significant down, you know, shifting of the hazard ratio, despite what look like better curves in, in this analysis. So just bottom line, um, if you are looking at a patient who's uh, progressed less than six months after having gotten a CDK inhibitor, both ESR1 mutant or not, are you going to use endocrine therapy or go on to chemo? Yeah, I think it's um, certainly predictive based on this data that patients who really progressed rapidly through first-line therapy, it may not be the best strategy to think about monotherapy. Now, the FDA label right now, you know, only requires ESR1 mutation. It doesn't have anything in terms of requiring specific duration of CDK. So I think if the patient has an ESR1 mutation, it's not it's not wrong based on the guideline right now to offer elicestrin, but I certainly would be thinking that the shorter the duration of therapy, the more I'm worried that there may be kind of upfront progression. I would really think strongly about a trial opportunity with a combinatorial regimen, and we'll talk about some of those uh, coming up. And I certainly would, would probably keep a close eye on the scans and on the clinical status with the expectation that there may be, you know, kind of a, a higher propensity for rapid progression. Okay, please continue. 
Great. So here's the uh, toxicity profile of elicestrin. Generally, as might be expected based on experience with the AIs and with fulvestrin, this is a well-tolerated drug. Most of the toxicity was low grade. Uh, you see some occasional GI stuff, nausea, anorexia, fatigue, uh, occasionally hot flashes, you know, rare episodes of low grade transaminitis, but overall generally very well-tolerated drug, which has also been my experience uh, in clinic thus far. Now, let's turn to some of the uh, other exciting oral SIRDs that are in active clinical development. And, you know, we're going to focus on two of these, but there are, you know, several of them uh, moving through the pipeline right now. We'll focus on camisestrant and imlunestrant. So here's the Serena 2 study. This is a phase two study of camisestrant, another oral SIRD, versus fulvestrant. In postmenopausal women, ER positive advanced metastatic breast cancer, 240 patients. They had to have been candidates for fulvestrant monotherapy. They were allowed to have measurable or non measurable disease. They had to have had progression on at least one line of prior endocrine therapy. They were not allowed to have had prior fulvestrant, unlike in the uh, Emerald study. Uh, here, we're really looking at 75 and 150 of camisestrant versus standard dosing of fulvestrant. There was a 300 milligram arm of camisestrant with 20 patients that was stopped early uh, for strategic reasons. Primary endpoint was PFS. There were interesting translational analyses here looking at circulating tumor DNA uh, and ESR1 that we'll touch on. So here is the outcome in the overall population. And again, I would draw your attention to that curve. Look at the steep drop in the curve right out of the gate, very similar to what we see in Emerald. And again, look at the control arm here with a median uh, PFS of just under four months, also not dissimilar from what we see in Emerald, which was a slightly uh, heavier uh, pretreated population that did allow prior fulvestrant. That's probably why the PFS there was even slightly lower. But again, we see a similar magnitude of benefit in the overall population from just under four months of the median PFS to about seven to eight months with uh, hazard ratios in the kind of 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 range. Um, and when we stratify again here by ESR1 status, we see again a very similar theme. Uh, pretty much uh, most or all of the benefit with camisestrant is seen in the ESR1 mutant subpopulation on the left. There we see median PFS improvements from about 2.2 months. So look at the downshift in the median PFS on fulvestrant with ESR1 mutation here, moving up to six months with 75 milligrams of camisestrin and 150 milligrams pushing it up to nine months. We don't see really as much separation of the curves in the ESR1 uh, wild type or non-detectable uh, population with median PFS range from five to, to seven months. So again, very similar story to what we see with elicestrin, looking like enrichment of activity uh, in the ESR1 mutant population with a little bit worse outcome uh, on the control arm with fulvestrin per our discussion earlier. Here's the toxicity experience with camisestrant. A couple of unique toxicities here, again, typically low grade uh, and manageable, but we see um, photopsia, so some, some visual changes, kind of sensation of light changing here. Uh, episodes of sinus bradycardia, which were to some degree dose dependent, as you can see, uh, typically low grade. And then some of the you know expected side effects, fatigue, uh, occasionally hot flashes, uh, occasionally GI toxicity or rare transaminitis. But uh, the photopsy and the bradycardia came up here uh, in this experience. And then I want to highlight this very exciting, uh, really potentially pivotal study, the Serena 6 study. This is an ongoing phase three effort, again, looking at camisestrin, but here we're really taking it to the next level. And in my opinion, this is really the future, not just of breast cancer care, but of all of uh, uh, medical oncology treatment moving forward. Here, what we're doing is a very large study. They're going to screen 3,000 patients. They're going to look for uh, patients that have had at least six months of first-line therapy with an aromatase inhibitor, letrozole or anastrozole, and any CDK4-6 inhibitor. Patients are not allowed to have had prior fulvestrant, uh, oral SIRD, or any other investigational endocrine agent. What they're going to do here is monitor ESR1 status via circulating tumor DNA in these patients. If the patient has clinical or radiographic progression, then they're treated as per standard of care. If they have rising circulating ESR1 allelic fraction, but no evidence of clinical or radiographic progression, then they will enter into the study. And here, patients will be randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either continue on the same current therapy, which would be the current standard of care because there's no radiographic progression yet, or switch the backbone to camisestrant.
right? So they will uh, continue on the CDK4-6 inhibitor in both arms, but they will switch from the first-line AI to camazestrant. And this is based on the PADA-1 study, uh, which had a similar design, but here we switched from an AI to fulvestrant, and that showed significant uh, clinical benefit after the switch. Um, and so I think here, this is a really exciting opportunity to, to deliver on this promise of personalized oncology. The idea being we're going to detect rising ESR1 in a kind of subclinical fashion. We're going to intervene early with a better, tolerable oral antiestrogen drug, and we're going to try to improve outcomes over the long term uh, before there's any uh, symptomatic or radiographic progression. Let me turn now to imlunestrant, which is another exciting oral SIRD. These are the EMBER series of studies. So we just talked about Serena. Now we're going to turn to EMBER. This is a phase 1A, B dose escalation and expansion. In the phase 1A portion, uh, these were ER positive metastatic or advanced patients who had less than or equal to three prior lines of therapy. Uh, the recommended phase 2 dose in this effort was determined to be 400 milligrams. There was a phase 1B dose expansion where there were two parts. There was a less heavily pretreated portion. Patients were allowed one or fewer prior therapies for advanced breast cancer, no prior CDK4-6 inhibitor. Those patients were randomized to the oral CERD imlunestrant with a bemocyclib or the oral CERD and a bemocyclib and an AI, so triplet therapy. There was a part B here where patients were more heavily pretreated. They were required to have had progression on a prior CDK inhibitor therapy. They were allowed to have had up to two prior lines. And here they did further exploration in an expansion phase of the monotherapy. And here's a summary of, of some of that data. So you can see across the board here, that's the dose escalation on the left-hand side uh, for single-agent imlunestrin, and then specifically at the recommended phase two dose of 400 milligrams. And then on the far right, we see uh, the combinations with a bemocyclib and an AI. So if you look at the bottom, I'll just draw your attention to a couple of things. The overall response rate increases as we move from left to right highest being in the triplet combination of imlunestrant, abema, and an AI. But also remember, this is a little bit of apples and oranges, right? On the right-hand side, in the combo with abema, these were uh, much less heavily pretreated patients. They were not allowed to have had prior CDK4-6 inhibitor. Whereas for the monotherapy group, these were in general more heavily pretreated population, uh, depending if it was part of the dose expansion uh, or on the initial dose escalation. We see the clinical benefit rate also increasing uh, as we move from left to right, uh, and we see the median progression-free survival increasing. But um, I would just, you know, caution interpretation here uh, in thinking about the amount of prior pretreatment. Clearly, the monotherapy at the recommended phase two dose in a fairly heavily pretreated population that had previously progressed on CDK4-6 inhibitor therapy was still meaningful with a response rate of over 10% and a clinical benefit rate exceeding 50% and a median progression-free survival of over seven months. Uh, again, taking that kind of apples to apples in comparison to the Emerald study uh, that's um, uh, on par. Just kind of conceptualize what your vision is with what's going on in the cell with the triplet, you know, you know, yeah. and what we know about adding, you know, a, a surd to an AI plus a CDK. Yeah, we don't know much. I mean, we have data, obviously, previously just looking at CERD plus AI together. Um, it is interesting, and, and I'll show you, actually, to answer that question too, Neil, I want to show you this slide here, which is kind of interesting. So even though if you look on the far right, here are the um, PFS curves. So if you look on the far right, the PFS curves for the triplet versus the doublet don't look that different. And yet we do see on this slide more responses, right? Radiographic responses. And I think your question is a great one, which is, you know, inside the cell, what are we doing here, right? So what we're trying to do is we're decreasing the total body you know, level of estrogen ligand with the AI. We're also working to degrade the receptor better and we're adding a bemocyclib, which we haven't talked much about today, but is the only CDK4-6 inhibitor with monotherapy efficacy and continuous dosing. So you're, you're really sort of hitting it from three different angles here. Um, and it's interesting to me, and, and I need to think a little more about this data and, and uh, you know, talk with some of my colleagues on the, on the study team. It's interesting to me that you see these deeper radiographic responses, right? You see the higher 
uh, numerical clinical benefit rate, but then the PFS curves really look kind of superimposable here. And I need to think a little bit more, we all need to think a little bit more about kind of the implications of that. What's interesting also is that looking at toxicity, uh, you don't, as you would expect, you don't see a lot of extra toxicity by adding the AI, right? You do see a lot of extra toxicity from adding the abema, and most of that toxicity is what we would expect, right? Diarrhea, fatigue, some cytopenia. Uh, but, you know, adding the AI doesn't really add much to that. So it, it's an interesting question. And um, biologically, you know, what's happening in the cell, and perhaps even more interesting than that would be for somebody that progresses on that, what are we seeing, right? What are the mechanisms that emerge out of a triplet combination of, you know, next generation oral CERD plus AI plus the best CDK uh, you, you know, sort of monotherapy agent we have at the moment. Uh, that's an interesting question. And, uh, you know, in the context of uh, the Ember Translational Biomarker Committee, we'll be looking at some of that data uh, moving forward. Um, uh, but I think your question is a great one about the mechanism inside the cell. And then just to sum up on this slide, you know, here we have toxicity data. Look at the single agent. It looks very similar to the others in the class. Occasionally some nausea, fatigue, occasionally loose stool. We see some abema driven uh, toxicity on the right hand uh, two columns. But overall, imlunestrant was sort of equally tolerable uh, to our prior experiences with the other CERDs. You mentioned totopsia and bradycardia with camisestrant. Do you see that or any other unusual things with imilunestrant? Yeah, I didn't see it reported in this data. I have to go back and actually ask the study team. It, it, it may be somewhat unique uh, from the data we've looked at so far to the camisestrant. You know, when I put patients on clinical trials with imilunestrant uh, or with elisestrant, I still mention this as a potential class effect. But anecdotally, I haven't seen as much of it, uh, for example, with imlunestrant or elisestrant, and I didn't see it reported uh, in the tables that we have so far. You know, another thing I was kind of thinking about is, you know, as you kind of advance through your discussion here, one thing you're not talking about too much is tamoxifen. Is that like out of the loop now? Well, I think there's always a place for uh, a drug like tamoxifen, and we will talk a little bit about SERMs when we talk about lasofoxifene, which is kind of a next-generation version of tamoxifen. Right. I think we know comparably less about some of the underlying molecular biology and genomics for tamoxifen. We have so much more experience in kind of contemporary clinical practice with, for example, the AIs and, and the SIRDs. Um, I don't think that it's uh, completely out of the loop in terms of practice. And I'll show you some data momentarily for a SERM that looks quite good, uh, even an ESR1 mutant sort of heavily pretreated breast cancer. Whether that supplants tamoxifen, uh, particularly in the metastatic setting, I think remains to be seen based on some upcoming phase three data that we'll talk about. But tamoxifen is a great drug. I still give it in clinic a lot. You know, you're certainly premenopausal women, but do you give it to postmenopausal women at any point, like late? You mean a metastatic setting? Not as often yeah, in the metastatic. metastatic setting. Yeah, not as often in the metastatic. In the adjuvant setting, I often find myself, even in postmenopausal women, using tamoxifen if there's a lot of toxicity on the AI, sure, particularly yeah. arthralgias, yeah. or patients that have really significant osteoporosis, but for whatever reason can't be on bone modifying therapy. You know, then we'll use tamoxifen. I haven't recently used it as much in the metastatic setting, uh, with the exception perhaps for um, uh, you know patients who. Um, are on, uh, you know, an AI and can't tolerate it, as we talked about in the adjuvant setting. Speaking of that, and speaking of this triplet combination, any thoughts about why you didn't see any increased benefit when you add tamoxifen to AI in the attack trial? Yeah, no, it's an, it's an interesting question. And I think it goes back to your question about what are we doing at the underlying, you know, level of, of, the cell. So perhaps adding, you know, a serm is less beneficial than downregulating the total amount of estrogen, right, with, you know, with an AI. Um, I think we would need to explore that with some pharmacokinetics and probably with some preclinical modeling to help understand it. But you're right. I mean, you know, you would think based on this data that you might see a little bit more activity with that sort of effort. So here's the Ember 3 study. So I wanted with each of these sections, um, I also want to just say, I should have given this as a disclaimer, I'm not showing all of the data related to Ember or all of the data related to Serena. I'm trying to focus on kind of uh, evidence of monotherapy activity so we can compare 
to Emerald, and then also thinking about a representative phase three trial that's ongoing that will inform this conversation. But there are lots of other trials within the Ember group, right, within the Serena group, uh, looking at different combinations, looking in, in, in different populations. But here's an example from Ember three, where we're looking phase three randomized open label. Um, this is for men or women with uh, locally advanced metastatic ear positive disease. Um, now, they didn't mandate a prior CDK inhibitor, but they acknowledge that based on contemporary practice patterns, they would expect most women coming on to this second line study to have had prior CDK inhibitor therapy. Uh, and um, they were not allowed to have had prior SIRD, prior chemotherapy, prior PI3 kinase or mTOR inhibitor. And here, the study design is kind of interesting. It was initially kind of a two-arm study, uh, imlunestrant monotherapy versus endocrine therapy of clinician's choice, fulvestrant or eczemestane, very similar in concept to the Emerald study. And then after the study started, they added a third arm, which was imlunestrant plus abemacyclib, uh, in part based on the data we had just looked at, right, for the uh, combination of the SIRD with abemacyclib. Now, what's interesting in terms of analysis of this study, the primary objective will be progression-free survival for A versus B, all comers, ITT, and A versus B, ESR1 mutants. So they didn't mandate ESR1 mutation. They'll stratify for that and they'll look at it after. If that analysis is positive, either of the above, all comers or ESR1, they'll go on to examine arm C. So arm C will only be analyzed for PFS if arm A versus B is positive, either intention to treat or ESR1 mutant. And so we'll see here uh, a lot of information, right? We'll see what imlunestrant looks like as a single agent potentially. We'll see what it looks like in ESR1 mutant. And we'll also see potentially the combo uh, with abema if either of those are positive. So let's come back to the case. 63-year-old patient, de novo hormone receptor positive metastatic disease. She progressed after three years of excellent response on letrozole and ribocyclib. Now bone and liver uh, progression, but uh, no visceral crisis. Her baseline CTDNA was negative, but when I resequenced her a progression, she had an ESR1 D538G and a cyclin E1 amplification. She did not have PIK3CA, P10, or AKT. So what do we think are the resistance drivers? Well, thinking back to the diagrams we looked at at the beginning, we probably suspect that the ESR1 is driving resistance to the aromatase inhibitor, while the cyclin E1 may be driving resistance to the CDK4-6 inhibitor component of the regimen. What is the role for elocestrin? So we now have an FDA approval in this situation for ESR1 mutant uh, metastatic disease after progression on prior endocrine therapy. And as we talked about earlier, look at the long duration of prior CDK therapy that this patient experienced. This might be you know, an excellent candidate for monotherapy based on the data we have from Emerald. Are we seeing efficacy and toxicity differences amongst these oral SIRDs? We just looked at data from uh, Serena 2 and from Ember. Uh, we're seeing pretty similar toxicity with the exception uh, that Neil just brought up, looking at maybe the photopsia and the sinus bradycardia, but overall low-grade toxicity, very tolerable. And you know, we're seeing very similar patterns if you look at these curves and kind of line them up next to each other. We're seeing the steep drop-off for both arms right off the jump, and then we're seeing separation of the curves that tends to be enriched in the ESR1 mutant subpopulation, and that's occurring kind of across the spectrum as we look at some of these uh, next-generation oral agents. So let's turn now to uh, targeted therapy, and we'll focus on phase three data from the Capitello 291 study. And let's go to a third case here. So here's a 63-year-old patient. She had early stage hormone receptor positive HER2 negative disease. She had surgery, radiation, and five years of tamoxifen back in 2010 that finished in 2015. She subsequently developed uh, approximately four years later metastatic recurrence and received letrozole and ribocyclib for four years um, uh, three to four years, 2019 to 2023. She now has a uh, disease progression both in the lung and in the bone. She had negative germline testing. She had a PET CT with these sites of progression, baseline CT DNA. So in this case, the last one was negative. The baseline CT DNA here showed a pic 3 ca uh, pathogenic canonical mutation in H1047R. And then when she progressed and I did the updated sequencing, she has persistent pic 3 ca and then a new ESR1 Y537S and loss of RB. So again, come back to the same question. What are the potential resistance drivers here? How do we differentiate what we would describe as a truncal mutation that's present probably early in the development of metastatic disease versus acquired mutations that might arise under selective pressure later? Uh, 
What is the role for alpelisib and capivacertib? And then how would you potentially sequence these agents in a patient that might be eligible for both? And then what about toxicity considerations across these two drug classes? So to answer these questions, let's look at the Capitella 291 study. This was a phase three randomized double-blind study published uh, in the New England Journal last year and presented at San Antonio prior to that. Here we have men or uh, women with advanced or metastatic hormone receptor positive breast cancer. They were allowed to have had up to two prior lines of endocrine therapy and no more than one prior line of chemotherapy. They were allowed, but not mandated, to have prior CDK inhibitors, and they had to have at least 51% of the population with CDK inhibitor exposure. They were not allowed to have had prior SIRD, including fulvestrin, mTOR, or PI3 kinase inhibitor, or AKT inhibitor. They had to have a hemoglobin A1C of less than 8%, uh, and they had to have well-controlled diabetes not requiring insulin. Uh, now, um, and this becomes important, they had to have an FFPE tumor sample but they allowed those samples to come from the primary. They didn't mandate a metastatic biopsy coming onto the study. I'm harping on this not because uh, I like translational genomics and, and you know molecular medicine, but because it's gonna impact our interpretation of the data that I'm about to show you. So there were over 700 patients randomized one-to-one -to, -one to fulvestrin and placebo or fulvestrin plus capivacertib at 400 milligrams. Interesting dosing schedule, different from our experience with other drugs, four days on, three days off, uh, stratified by liver mets, uh, prior CDK inhibitor and geographic region. Primary endpoint was PFS uh, overall. And then in uh, tumors with AKT pathway alteration, but remember the biopsies were a little bit from all over the place here. Here's the intention to treat population. We see uh, improvement in the median progression-free survival from about three and a half months to over seven months with a hazard ratio of 0 0.6 and a p-value of less than 0 0.01. Here's the data from the AKT altered tumors, which um, a couple things I'll point out here. So they had over 310 patients with AKT mutation. They had over 410 patients who were AKT wild type or unknown meaning they weren't able to determine whether the tumor was AKT mutant or not. Those went into the AKT you know, negative group. Uh, and here we see very similar curves, 3.1 to 7.3 months with a hazard ratio of 0 0.50 and a similar p-value. So there didn't really seem to be a signal with this data for AKT mutation. And they included here, importantly, uh, PIK3CA, AKT, or P10 um, altering mutations. And then here's the overall survival data. And uh, this is from uh, 18 months uh, in the overall population. We saw an improvement in overall survival from about 65% in the control to uh, up to 74% uh, in the combo arm and sort of similar uh, pattern for the AKT mutant tumors as we saw uh, with the data I just showed you for progression-free survival. Here's the toxicity, and this is also really important to kind of put side by side with the Solar One uh, study and the data for alpelisib. So here, uh, if you look at the Capiva group, uh, there were some expected toxicities, though most of them were low grade and manageable, grade one to two, diarrhea, rash, uh, other GI toxicity, including nausea, fatigue, um, anorexia. Look at hyperglycemia. So here, any grade hyperglycemia was only 16.3%. And again, most of that was manageable grade one to two, occasionally stomatitis, uh, and occasionally some blood count abnormality. So overall, uh, perhaps uh, a little bit easier to tolerate than our experience with alpelisib so far, particularly as related to some of the GI toxicities and uh, hyperglycemia. Let's come back to the case. So remember, this patient had um, tamoxifen for five years and then, you know, four years later developed recurrence, did really well on letrozole and ribo, and now is progressing. Now, ctDNA at baseline had pic 3 ca 1047 r and then when we repeated the ctDNA several years later, she had persistent uh, H1047R, and now a new ESR1 and RB mutation. So here, the PIK3CA was probably an early kind of metastasis initiating event. It's what we would call truncal. It'll likely be present kind of on all subsequent sequencing assays, whether you do that solid or liquid. We see acquisition after progression on the AI of the ESR1 activating mutation, and that Y537S we're going to talk about again in a few minutes, actually tends to be kind of one of the worst players for ESR1 mutations, since they're not all created equal. And we see loss of RB, uh, again, probably contributing to the CDK4-6 inhibitor resistance. 
I was just going to ask uh, whether we know the percent in the, quote, wild type group, uh, the percent of them that were unknown. Because I guess, you know, you, I was looking I at that. Is, I couldn't. Yeah, I couldn't you find it. I was that looking 40% for that number. of them would be positive. Yeah. And then exactly. the other thing I was curious yeah. about is, um, you know, you've been talking about when you say pick three CA mutations and ESR1 in your you know, slides here. You've been not just saying that you've been putting in, you know, the specific type of PIC3 and the specific type of ESR1, you know, like PIC3 H1047R. So does exactly. that make a difference, the type of mutation? I think it does. And I think it's a really important point. And um, I think as we've entered this era of precision medicine and breast cancer and sort of genomically informed treatment, the first phase of these discussions were along the lines of ESR1 plus or minus, right? pic 3 ca plus or minus. But it's now going to become increasingly important to understand not just whether the mutation is present, but exactly what sort of mutation is present. And I'll explain why in a second. In addition, it's going to be important to take into account the concurrent genomic alterations, right? Not just whether it's ESR1 alone, but is it ESR1 plus RB? Is it ESR1 plus AKT? Uh, and this is important because because as the field becomes more complicated, as we have more FDA approvals and choices in the second and third line setting, we're going to need to take a more nuanced approach and look at the entire spectrum of genetic alterations in the tumor. Also, preclinically, and soon, I think, clinically, we're going to start to see important differences emerge between these next-generation antiestrogens with regard to specific ESR1 variants. So some of the differentiation that might occur in the next 6, 12, 18 months are actually going to happen at the level of, well, how does this drug do against Y537S? How does this drug do against D538G? Because these things are not all created equal, both in the laboratory and in the patient. So a uh, random question, does it make a difference what day you draw the glucose? Like yeah, if that's a great it? question. Great question, because of the unique dosing schedule, right? Um, yeah. I'm actually not sure. I have to go back and talk with the pharmacy team. My guess is on the study, they had checked it both on and off drug, and there are some guidelines that we would you know, start up with the help of our pharmacist in the first couple of weeks, just like you do with uh, alpelacib, which is you know, sort of continuous dosing. Uh, I, I would suspect it probably would make a difference, and you'd want to make sure you check the blood glucose on drug, right? Not necessarily during the off day, but while the drug is at maximal concentration. But again, it depends a little bit on the half-life. Um, and I have to go uh, look with my colleagues in pharmacy and, and endocrine to, to recollect uh, exactly the kinetics of the, the glucose change. Now, I think one of the key questions, and um, this comes up every time we have talks on this or every time we have uh, strategy kind of discussions with our partners in the community. What do you do if a patient's eligible for both alpelacib and Capiva Sertive? And this is going to become an increasingly good problem to have as more drugs within the same group are approved in the next couple of years. We don't have data for this, right? So nobody on Solar One uh, had prior AKT inhibitor therapy, and nobody on Capitella 291 had prior PI3K inhibitor therapy. So take my answer to this with a grain of salt. But biologically speaking, if you think about the pathway, PI3K is at the top, right? And as you move down, you hit P10, AKT, mTOR. So we know from translational efforts uh, coming out of Solar One and other experiences with PI3K inhibitors that dysregulation of P10 and upregulation of AKT are potential resistance drivers to PI3 kinase inhibitors. So if the patient can tolerate both, meaning they don't have bad diabetes or blood sugar or GI issues, logically it would make sense to start upstream because potentially you could then hit the downstream target later in the setting of resistance. So in my practice, if the patient can tolerate both, like they have a pic 3 ca mutation plus or minus you know, something else, I would try to start with the alpelacib. And then I would think about sequencing in the Capiva sort of later, understanding, again, we do not have any prospective data for that. I'm basing that simply upon understanding the, the sequence in the pathway, right? The oncogenic signal transduction pathway. Many people here, I think, prefer Capiva-Sertib because of the toxicity data that we just reviewed. 
And again, you know, GI toxicity, rash, hyperglycemia, mucositis, but, you know, most of us are starting to feel like maybe the AKT inhibitor and the other AKT inhibitors we've used in early phase trials are slightly more tolerable. We also have some next generation PI3 kinase inhibitors coming online with better toxicity profiles, you know, less GI, less uh, hyperglycemia. So let's finish up um, with uh, a couple of uh, future um, anti-estrogen agents. And again, this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, we chose these two because there's some really exciting data that's just come out, but there are lots of other um, molecules as well, other oral SIRDs, other uh, CRANs, Protax, et cetera, different uh, mechanisms of degrading uh, estrogen receptor. But let's talk about veptigestrant, the pr proteolysis targeting chimera, and lazofoxifene, the next generation selective estrogen receptor modulator. So the Veritac studies uh, refer to um, this new Protac, Veptigestrant. So this is a phase one, two study. First, we had a part A dose escalation. The original name was ARV471, now called Veptigestrant, looking at safety and tolerability. Then we had a dose uh, expansion, cohort expansion, part B. Again, monotherapy. And then more recently, we've had a phase 1B combination of this PROTAC, proteolysis targeting chimera with palbocyclid. Now, this drug is similar conceptually to a selective estrogen receptor degrader, but does it through a slightly different mechanism and has more efficient uh, ER degradation than traditional SIRDs if you look at the preclinical laboratory data. So here's the Veritac uh, phase 2 cohort expansion. So this is part B. Uh, ER positive advanced breast cancer, measurable or non-measurable, at least one prior endocrine therapy. They had to have had prior CDK4-6 inhibitor. They were allowed to have had up to one prior chemotherapy. They looked at two doses, 200 milligrams and 500 milligrams, and eventually decided to move forward with the 200 milligrams. Here, the primary endpoint was actually clinical benefit rate, secondary endpoint, PFS, OS, objective response rate, pharmacokinetics, an exploratory endpoint looking at ESR1, but it wasn't required. So they had ESR1 wild type and ESR1 mutant. So here's some data presented by Dr. Hurwitz and the team in 2022. Uh, this was from the initial phase one effort. Again, you can see the two lines here are two doses of veptigestrin, 200 and 500, actually 200 in total. So the dark line is 200, the light blue line is everybody, including the, the 500. And you can see there really wasn't you know, added benefit with the 500, the two curves were, were kind of superimposable. Uh, and again, a couple of things to notice. You see the steep drop off in the curve that's been, excuse me, a common theme for our discussion today. And then you also see a shift in the curves to the right for the ESR1 mutant population. So we had a median PFS of three to four months uh, in all patients, and then upwards of five to six months in the um, ESR1 mutant cohort. Again, a fairly consistent finding for a fairly heavily pretreated population that had at least a CDK inhibitor, plus sometimes a second antiestrogen, plus sometimes a chemo. Here's updated efficacy from San Antonio 2023. The overall response rate across the entire cohort in this uh, expansion was 8.3%. Two patients had a confirmed uh, response. Median progression-free survival, three and a half months in, in the ITT and almost six months in the ESR1 mutant population. And here you can see the uh, waterfall plot uh, divided by uh, ESR1 status. Toxicity, the drug was, uh, again, generally very well tolerated, mostly grade one to two uh, fatigue, hot flashes, occasionally a little bit of arthralgia, rare, low-grade transaminitis. There was one uh, grade three QT prolongation that was um, uh, attributed potentially to a concomitant uh, second drug the patient was taking, and then one episode of uh, grade three anemia. There were um, uh, no dose reductions required at 200 milligrams for uh, uh, treatment-related adverse events. And this is interesting too. So here's a translational analysis, uh, again, looking over time, taking serial ESR1 uh, circulating tumor DNA levels for patients on veptigestrant. Here we see um, within one cycle of treatment at 200 milligrams, a really significant drop in ESR1 mutational load that was sustained uh, over many cycles, right, for these patients, over five, seven, 10 plus cycles uh, in many instances. So we're seeing target engagement, we're seeing rapid drop in ctDNA ESR1 uh, kinetics, and we're seeing that that drop stays low uh, over time. And here, again, looking forward, uh, there are many uh, studies in the Veritac portfolio, but I just wanted to highlight relevant to our discussion today, Veritac 2. This is phase three 
veptigestrant versus fulvestrant. Uh, again, metastatic ER positive breast cancer. They had to have had one prior line of CDK inhibitor therapy. They were not allowed to have had prior fulvestrant uh, uh, PI3K pathway inhibitors. Um, they were um, not allowed to have had, uh, I think, prior chemotherapy here. Uh, patients had to have um, measurable or non-measurable bone-only disease, no active brain mets. And here, monotherapy, ESR1 wild type and mutant allowed, it will be stratified uh, you know, for ESR1 status at the end. Veptigestrant monotherapy at 200 versus fulvestrant at 500, 560 patients planned. This is enrolling right now. And again, will help us line up monotherapy single agent data in you know, this kind of second to third line setting, similar to some of the studies we previously looked at for Ember 3 uh, and for uh, Emerald. And then last, uh, let me turn my attention to lazafoxifene, which is also a very exciting drug with a long history of uh, development. This is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. There's actually very extensive safety experience with this drug as it was previously developed uh, to assist with uh, bone health. Uh, and so there are large uh, phase three studies in the past with you know long safety track record here. So these are the ELAINE studies. This is the ELAINE 1 study. Uh, this is a randomized signal seeking effort looking at lazafoxifene compared to fulvestrant uh, in the um, uh, early phase setting. Pre- and postmenopausal ER-positive advanced breast cancer, these patients had to have positive ESR1 mutation required. They had to have progression on a prior CDK inhibitor. There were over 100 patients. They were randomized to 5 milligrams of lazafoxifene single agent versus standard dose fulvestrant. The primary outcome was progression-free survival. This was just published, I think it was last month, uh, in Annals of Oncology, uh, led by Dr. Getz and team. Here are the survival curves. So again, uh, uh, there's that drop-off, right? Very steep drop-off right off the jump, and the curves separate very similar to the other next-generation anti-estrogen experiences we've had in the second, third-line setting. Median PFS improvement from about 16 weeks up to 24 weeks. Um, that was felt to be clinically meaningful, but it didn't meet the um, uh, p-value uh, requirement here. So the hazard ratio was just under 0 0.7. The um, Response rates were also appreciably better uh, in uh, lazafoxifene versus fulvestrin, as you can see from the waterfall plot uh, to the right. This I found very interesting. Um, here is translational data looking at ESR1 uh, mutational status and circulating tumor DNA burden uh, in ELAINE 1. What you're looking at here in the green are the percent of patients in the study who had a decrease in the allelic burden of each ESR1 mutation. And you can see in every single instance, there was a better reduction in ESR1 mutational status for the lazafoxifene versus the fulvestrant. And in some cases, it was a bigger drop than others. For example, Y537S. And this is coming back to the point that we were discussing a few minutes ago. Not all of these ESR1 mutations behave equally, particularly with standard therapies like fulvestrant, the Y537S potentially being more kind of pathogenic than some of the others. And on the right-hand side, this is even more interesting. You look at the overall median allelic fraction change. So if you combine all ESR1 mutants and you look at the lazafoxifene group versus the fulvestrant group, the median drop was about 15% for fulvestrant, but over 85% for lazafoxifene. And if you look specifically at the, e, at the Y537S, the median change was actually up in fulvestrant and way down in lazafoxifene. So this was very exciting data, particularly for the Y537S. And I was very impressed with this team really moving forward and thinking ahead at the level that we are discussing today, right? Thinking about not just ESR1 positive or negative, but what is happening with the clonal dynamics of each specific ESR1 mutation on standard therapy and on lazafoxifene. And these are the sort of translational efforts that I think are going to set the stage for the future as we work to decide which of these drugs should best be used in any particular patient.
Here's the Elaine 2 study. So the sequel was a single arm phase two effort combining lazafoxifene with abemacyclib in heavily pretreated patients. So here we had almost 30 patients. The abema was given at 150 milligrams twice daily. The primary endpoint was safety and tolerability. Second endpoint was progression-free survival. These patients, again, had to have ESR1 mutation. They had to progress fo following one to two prior lines of therapy, uh, and that could include fulvestrant. It didn't require CDK inhibitor therapy, but 97% of the patients, virtually all of the patients, had prior CDK inhibitor therapy. So this is really looking at lazifoxifene abema after prior progression on AI or fulvestrin and a CDK inhibitor. And here we saw a really impressive single arm clinical benefit rate of over 55% and an estimated median progression free survival of over 13 months. Now, this is a single arm study, so we didn't have a comparator, but we had previously published a multi institutional experience looking at almost 90 patients who got a BEMA after prior palbo progression. And there, in that heterogeneous retrospective cohort, the estimated median PFS was only five to six months. So here you're seeing double that with lazofoxifene plus abema. Toxicity profile was manageable and expected. Again, you see some diarrhea and GI toxicity, mostly attributable to the abema. You see some of the same toxicity that we have seen with lazofoxifene previously, um, occasionally a little bit of GI stuff and fatigue, hot flashes. Uh, and there were two to three episodes of thrombosis, which is something we need to pay particular attention to. We know tamoxifen has you know, an appreciable rare rate of thrombosis, and that uh, also occurs with abemacyclib. So it's something they're going to be looking at moving forward forward. In at least one or two of those episodes, the patient had had a knee surgery or some other uh, potentially inciting event. They were able to take anticoagulation and, and proceed on treatment. So here to conclude, again, one final study. This is the Elaine 3 study, lazofoxifene plus abema versus fulvestrin plus abema. So this is really a purely second-line population. They had to have ESR1 mutation. They had to progress on prior palbo or ribo, and they're going to be randomized to fulvestrin plus abema or lazofoxifene plus abema. Uh, this is a registrational phase 3. Primary output here is progression-free survival. This is also, to some extent, based on the post-monarch study, which we haven't studied yet, looking at abema and fulvestrant versus uh, fulvestrant alone after prior CDK inhibitor progression. We'll soon have data from that study. If that study's positive, the control arm here will reflect the interventional arm in that study. This is just a table looking at some of the things we've discussed today, different agents, um, different inclusion criteria, different size of the study, um, whether the results are available, positive versus negative, or ongoing. And we're seeing SIRDs, Protax, CIRM. And then just to conclude, ESR1 mutations are common, particularly under selective pressure. They are rare in untreated early stage patients. There are other key drivers of resistance to antiestrogens and CDK inhibitors, including cell cycle regulators and oncogenic signal transduction pathways. Uh, it's important to think about serial next generation sequencing, typically via blood based biopsy, to look for those truncal baseline mutations as well as the acquired mutations on treatment. We saw elicestrin had single agent activity in emerald, which seemed to be maximal in ESR1 mutant patients with long durations of CDK inhibitor treatment. There are multiple oral SIRDs in development with variable activity uh, and a trend toward more activity in the ESR1 mutants. Capiva Sertib with fulvestrant was active following progression on prior antiestrogen therapy in the Capitella 291 study and was recently approved in PIK 3 ca uh, P10 and AKT mutant patients. And we're looking at exciting new strategies, Protax, SERMs, new oral SIRDs, both as single agent and in combination. And I'll just end with a couple of um, questions. What's the optimal approach to second-line therapy, particularly now with multiple new agents, none of which have been crossed, you know, compared against each other? Which next-generation antiestrogens will have a future as single agents? And what are the best combination strategies? Is it with a targeted therapy? Is it with a CDK inhibitor? How do distinct ESR1 mutations drive resistance? We were talking about that throughout the day today. How do we think about concurrent genomic alterations, ESR1 plus PIK3CA, ESR1 plus AKT? How do we leverage new technology to build upon available targeted sequencing, looking at RNA, looking at methylome, looking at single cell? These are all things we're working on right now in the translational space. And how do we personalize therapy in real time? How do we move away from this traditional you know, scan-based uh, uh, symptom-based approach, looking at serial tumor DNA dynamics, 
like we talked about with Serena 6. And then how do we integrate other agents? We haven't talked about antibody drug conjugates, immune therapies, all of the other classes uh, that are under active clinical development right now. Great. Wow, that was incredible. I learned so much. Just a couple of follow-up questions. I, I was saying, where's tamoxifen? Well, it looks like at least there's a CIRM in play here. Let me ask you something. Is LASO like under patent or is it generic at this point? No, I think they're actually developing um, a sort of distinct patent for the, you know, potentially for its use in this situation, uh, you know, because, you know, lasofoxifene has been around for a long time. I'm not totally familiar with the whole, you know, uh, uh, patent history of it. But, um, you know, the company is pushing forward, you know, uh, I think quite effectively uh, with uh, these Elaine studies and the Elaine 3 study. We're very excited about that. And I do think, uh, to your point, CIRMs uh, have a big future, uh, not just in, in adjuvant therapy, as we've used tamoxifen traditionally, but also in, uh, in the metastatic setting, probably with something like lasofoxifene. So speaking of CIRMs, you know, I was talking about how we got started talking about endocrine therapy and that at that point, you also saw high dose androgen or impeded androgen. I don't know if anybody ever uses that. And also high dose progestins, also high dose estrogen. I mean, the actual yes. original tamoxifen study was randomized against high dose estrogen. So these are all to me, I'm not going to say CIRM like, but com I guess direct top. I never really understood why they worked. I kind of visualize it maybe a direct toxic effect or something, but are those right. mechanisms also in play? I think that's a great point, and I agree with you that um, that whole field, which you know, uh, I haven't had as much personal experience, just given the plethora of kind of other opportunities we have to treat folks, and and you know, those of us who trained in the last like ten years, it's kind of scary, right? The idea of dumping you know high dose estrogen on these patients, but you're right, there's a long track record of success for that, which I think is not as well understood mechanistically, you know, to your point as some of these other things. Like it's sort of like an overload effect on the pathway, right? It becomes toxic at a certain at a certain level. And I think you're right. Of all of the drugs that are currently in development or available, the CIRMs are probably most mechanistically like just pouring progestin or androgen or estrogen on top of the tumor because the selective modulator effect is an agonist, right, at a certain level or in a certain right. tissue. Uh, right. And so biologically, right. we can probably learn a lot from, you know, these preclinical efforts with lasofoxifene and even some of the older data with tamoxifen, you know, in that setting. Yeah. I mean, like I hear Oliver Sarder and other prostate people now, sometimes they use high dose testosterone in prostate cancer, which kind of right. reminded me that the actual tamoxifen versus DES study, actually tamoxifen was not more effective. It was just better tolerated. So right. it really is effective. Right. Um, the other thing I was going to ask you, getting kind of back more to where things are today and where oncologists need to be today, one of the things that seems like it's evolving. I know it seems simple, but you know, we're dealing with general medical oncologists, so they got to be up to speed on a lot of different things nowadays. But is the concept of sort of the triple biomarker approach to second line endocrine therapy, you know, that you need to know these three, the results of these three assays in order to make a decision, which I think is a fairly new concept. I mean, it's sort of evolved. I don't exactly hear people labeling it that way, but it seems like that has become an issue. Uh, and from that point of view, um, is uh, liquid and tissue kind of equal? Or what are the advantages and, and disadvantages of each in terms of this clinical situation? I think this is uh, arguably the most important topic and question, you know, as I interface a lot with our partners in the community, and I, I have a great time, you know, collaborating with, with our uh, general oncology friends and, you know, the vast majority of patients across the U.S., right, receive their care in the community, you know, setting with general oncologists. And I think um, a couple of things to answer your question. First, I do believe uh, for metastatic ER-positive breast cancer, uh, and really, re probably for most solid tumors now, given the agnostic, you know, approvals with TMB and, and TREC and other things, you know, next generation sequencing, either of solid or liquid assay, really, I think is important and critical. I think where we get into the nuance and where we start to have some of these kind of expert consensus guidelines and discussions are thinking about everything you just said. Okay, when do you sequence? How do you sequence? How often do you sequence, et cetera? Um, 
the liquid technology continues to improve. And I mean that in multiple ways. First of all, the depth of the sequencing gets more and more sensitive. We're able to detect things at lower and lower allelic fractions. Second, the turnaround time continues to improve, where instead of having to wait three, four weeks right now, we can get it back usually in about 10 days. And the cost is coming down. More companies are developing these assays, so there's more competition in, in, in place. Generally, there's about an 80% concordance rate, as we talked about a little bit earlier, between solid biopsy sequencing and liquid biopsy sequencing. And I tend to prefer liquid sequencing because you can detect alterations that might be shed from other sites, right, than the one that you biopsy. It's far less invasive for the patient, right? And it's easy to repeat and then compare kind of apples to apples. I showed you that example of the patient where we had two time points and you can see the mutational flux over time. Add three, four, five time points to that. And we're going to be entering a world where we're using it to determine both the overall burden of DNA so it'll replace tumor markers to some extent. It'll replace scans eventually, I think. And you're learning about dynamic changes in tumor shrinking, tumor growing, and which alleles are rising, right? You see this RB that might be at 1%, and now it's at 5%, and now it's at 20%, right? And that's driving resistance to the CDK inhibitor. So I think you can use solid biopsy. You can use liquid biopsy. I think the kind of yes to all of the above, I tend to do both at diagnosis and then liquid only later. Although traditional information like ER status, HER2 status, PDL1 status, at the moment, you still need a solid biopsy for that. So if the tumor is behaving in a different way and you know we need to understand changes in receptor status, I still will do a solid tumor biopsy. So you need to have the receptors, you need potentially to have the PDL1, you need to have the next generation sequencing. Uh, and I kind of make the joke that those of us in breast cancer are like, you know, five to eight years behind lung cancer, right? So they had like EGFR, ALK, ROS1, and now we have PI3K, AKT, ESR1, and then they developed T790M. And now we're starting to figure out Y537S and sort of, you know, it's an iterative process, right? And so we're, we're moving in the same direction that our thoracic oncology colleagues have, have already set a paradigm for in terms of understanding molecular genomics and then understanding response and resistance and then developing better drugs kind of in the resistance setting.